Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sandy Quinn, and I'm president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. You, <laughs> thank you. You are in our exact replica of the East Room, what they call at the White House America's Grand Ballroom. It's the biggest room in the White House, and it's our main venue for having important speakers as we do tonight. I hope all of you are members. If you're not, I hope you'll join tonight. And if you do, we will give you this attractive mug, What Would Nixon Do?, which you can add to your coffee table or your desk at the office and be the point of conversation among all your friends. And there's a membership desk in the lobby. Um, I hope that all of you know that all summer long we have a prisoner of war exhibit called An All-American Homecoming, which is a tribute to the POWs from Vietnam, 200 of which were in this very room on May 24th, where we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the great dinner that the Nixons gave at the White House uh, when they returned from, from Vietnam. These are great patriots, and we salute them in our exhibit, which will be open all summer long. Tonight's speaker is Rich Lowry. You know him from Fox and his multiple television appearances over the years. He is National Review's editor, senior editor. He runs it, very popular publication, which uh, I'm sure many of you read. It has great, uh, uh, great bylined articles. It's a chronicle of the conservative movement and a terrific uh, publication. He has been here before. Uh, we are delighted to uh, welcome him again with his new book called Lincoln Unbound. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Rich Lowry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here at the Nixon Library, and thanks to all you for being here and for the folks at the library for hosting me. Um, it's always good to be among friends and among fellow, I assume, embattled conservatives, right, since you're conservatives here in, in California. I know a thing or two about what it's like to be embattled a conservative as some, uh, a very right-wing guy who lives and works in New York City. Um, I used to live in Union Square in New York, which was the very epicenter of Obama mania in 07 and 08. And I still remember on election night, I was up late at Fox doing commentary 2008, and like two or three in the morning, I went back home. I was you know, tired, worn out, irritable, depressed. Um, and it was here at Union Square, very close to New York University, it was like we had won a war. Uh, the streets were thronged, people were chanting, singing, banging on pots, uh, randomly high-fiving people walking down the sidewalk, including me, you know, little, little did they know. And uh, whenever uh, I encounter these kind of uh, um, liberal youth, I'm reminded of uh, a Reagan story when he was governor here in California and uh, at a time when protest oftentimes spontaneously broke out and he apparently was at a meeting of the Board of Trustees of the University of California. And while he was there, uh, a demonstration started at the front of the building, and a staff wanted to sneak out the back. He said, no, I'm going to go right through them. So he walks through the uh, protesters, gets in his car, and you know, they're kind of scruffy, hippie-looking types, maybe you know, haven't bathed very recently. And they start banging on the car and chanting, we are the future. We are the future. And the story goes that Reagan cracks the window a little bit and says, well, in that case, I'm going to sell my bonds. <laughs> um, I've, I've written this book on Lincoln, uh, as you know now, which has been out about a week. And I've had some interesting experiences. One of them, I, my wife and I live in New York City in a doorman building. And one of our doormen, a great guy, immigrant from Ireland, um, very hardworking, just had a kid. From what I can tell, basically has conservative instincts through uh, things you hear him uh, randomly say. So I, I give him this book, and he's delighted to 
get it, and he says, oh, this is wonderful. And then he says, wait a minute, you wrote a book about Lincoln? I thought you were a Republican. <laughs> and he, he meant this, this wasn't a jibe, right? He wasn't trying to get at me. This was a sincere inquiry, <laughs> which I think tells us uh, how much we need to do to save uh, the true uh, legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And that's what I want to discuss with you a little bit um, tonight, because progressives have been after Abraham Lincoln for about 100 years, started with TR, FDR was very uh, intense on this, and Barack Obama has been even more intense, right? He announces for president in Springfield before the old uh, state house there. He takes the oath on the uh, Lincoln Bible. I believe someone told me, I haven't independently confirmed this, but that he's mentioned Abraham Lincoln 230 times or something since he's been president. And I, I just think it's, it's very important for us to get Abraham Lincoln right, because if you get Lincoln right, then you get America right. Uh, and you get what sh I believe should be our an animating purpose as conservatives. So <clears throat> by way of introduction, I think there are common misconceptions of Lincoln. We tend to think of him as uh, a man of the earth, uh, this kind of accidental president, a tribune of the common people and common sense. And I think that really underestimates him, and he wouldn't be surprised by that because he was underestimated throughout his life. And part of it was just very superficial. It was the way he looked, this ungainly character. He, he said once in the White House that he, he um, had the insight that God must love common-looking people more than anyone else because he made more of them. Um, but he was common-looking. But uh, anyone who has um, judged him on the basis of his looks or thought any of those things I just mentioned about him was making a grave mistake. This is a ferociously ambitious man and an ambitious man um, from his very youth, really, possessed of an exceptional and extraordinary intelligence. Again, evident from the time of his youth, people would report that he, he was very curious about politics when he was young and he would borrow newspapers. And when he'd return them, he'd be able to basically recite entire editorials line by line, just an incredible uh, memory. And then he had you know, a wisdom about the world, a judgment about things and about human nature. Um, I, I love a little story he used to tell when he was trying to um, illustrate how if you try to change people's behavior on the promise of a far off reward or on the threat of a far off um, uh, um, something bad that's going to happen to you, you're not really going to get very far. And he used to say there is this Irishman who stole a spade. And someone uh, went to him and said, uh, Patty, you know, they used politically incorrect language then, you know, you're going to have to pay for that when you meet the end of your days and you meet your maker. And the Irishman says, well, in that case, if you're going to credit me that long, I think I'll take another. Um, so Lincoln, one of the reasons he knew so much about human nature was he just, the, the kind of life he led and how roughed up he was by life. He had the most inauspicious beginnings you can imagine. He's born in Kentucky, moves to Indiana, literally in the middle of nowhere, literally in a log cabin. And there are reports uh, in that area that people who had log cabins at night, when they had fires in the cabins, they would see the shining eyes of bears peering in at them uh, outside. There is a, a story about a, uh, a little girl who in this area uh, was killed by a panther because her brother wasn't able to kill the panther with a hatchet to the skull fast enough. Okay, so this is not suburban bliss. This is a, a very um, unforgiving environment. Lincoln said he had, a put, he had an ax put in his hand almost at once and he handled that most useful instrument, instrument until about the age uh, 23. But one of the great ironies of Lincoln's life is that he didn't like axes. He didn't like splitting rails, even though we know him as the rail splitter. He wanted to escape uh, this unforgiving uh, environment. His, his mother, at a very young age, and his aunt, his uncle, came down with something that was called milk sick. A cow would wander off into the forest would eat poison weeds, its milk would become poisoned, no one would know this, you would drink the milk and you would die 
an indescribably horrible death in about a week. So this happens to his mom, I think he's about eight or so. He has to um, fashion the, the wood coffin with his father to bury her. There's no, no one to give a sermon. Um, eventually, uh, someone, a minister, happened by the, the uh, area you know, months later. And um, his sister would die in childbirth, which was not uncommon. And Lincoln's family was very upset about this, thought the in-laws didn't do enough to, hate her, to help her. The in-laws said, well, uh, we wanted to help her, but the nearest doctor was too drunk to help her, which again gives you an idea of uh, this way of life. And Lincoln said there was nothing to excite an ambition for education in this time and in this place. His mother signed her name with an X. His stepmother, who's very caring and was a, a great blessing to him, she signed her name with an X. His father could barely sign his name. Lincoln said he could bunglingly sign his name, which is, there's a note of a trace of contempt in that uh, description. There were schools, but a, huge, a big part of what instructors did was to beat the kids. Okay? Um, there's a, Lincoln told a story in the White House that kind of captured what the educational environment um, was like. He said there is this, this school room of kids, and they're reading from the book of Daniel. Now you have to cast your mind way back into this mid-19th century context when it was actually legal to read the Bible in a schoolroom in America. And they were reading from the book of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And this one boy stumbles over the name Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, right? Anyone could do that. I probably couldn't, didn't say them uh, correctly myself. Boom, hit, hit up against the head. So they, they're go reading, continuing to read the passage. And the kid's kind of calculating in his head. He's seeing how many kids are left till it comes back around to him. And he's looking ahead to the lion, seeing, and he just starts whimpering again. And the, the instructor's like, now, now what? Now what's wrong? Now, you know, why you're crying? He's like, master, there come those three damn fellows again. <laughs> he probably got hit again. So Lincoln wants to escape this, OK? This is all, this is, might be charming to us. It might, for us, speak very well of him, that he came from this. Everything in his life was geared to escaping this. If you want a story that really captures Lincoln and his ambition in this way, it's a story he told in the White House about his boyhood that obviously stuck with him and meant a lot to him. He, was, um, he had uh, fashioned a rowboat, and he was by the side of the Ohio River, and two guys rode up in a carriage with their luggage, and there was a steamboat out in the middle of the river they wanted to meet, but there was no wharf. So they wanted Lincoln to row them out there. He willingly does it, helps them with their luggage, and as they're getting on the steamboat, he says, wait a minute, you forgot to pay me. And to his surprise, each one of them throws a silver half dollar at the bottom of his boat. And he said, all those years later, in the White House, he says, and I realized at that moment I had earned my first dollar. And he said the world opened up to him, and he was a more hopeful and optimistic being from that time. So Lincoln wanted to escape that isolation, and he wanted to make possible America where no one had to live in that kind of isolation ever again. And in a nutshell, that's why he didn't become a Democrat. He grew up surrounded by Democrats, people who worshipped Andrew Jackson, the great general, who was a mean son of a bitch, OK? If you, if you remember the, the late Senator Arlen Specter, if you take someone with his personality, except for he might kill you, that was Andrew Jackson. But those were the, the people, those um, Andrew Jackson was a people his family loved, the, the neighbors loved. And the, the Jacksonian Democrats and the Jeffersonian Democrats before them, they romanticized the backwoods, the frontier. They romanticized agrarian life and agriculture. And Lincoln had seen that, he'd experienced it, and he wanted to have nothing to do with it ever again. So he goes in the opposite direction. He becomes a Whig and then uh, a Republican. And Lincoln and the Whigs were consumed with the question, how do we blow up that subsistence economy that's on the frontier? How do we make something different? And this um, was the purpose of their entire program. Well, you needed cash. You couldn't have a barter economy. You needed cash, so the Whigs supported the banks. You wanted industry, because you didn't want a country that was just exclusively agricultural for all time. 
So they supported a tariff. You needed markets. If you're going to have markets, you have to knit together the country. So they support and they're excited by canals and railroads. And this is where the more activist side of Abraham Lincoln comes in with regard uh, to the role of government because he supported subsidizing those enterprises. But the context is very important. Because again, you're Abraham Lincoln. You're growing up in this area. There is no way to get goods to the market, unless perhaps you live near a river. And they would literally make handmade rafts, and they'd float their goods down to New Orleans, which is one way to get them to market. The problem was getting back up. And before the steamboat, you couldn't really. A lot of people walked back home. There's stories that Lincoln's father made this trip once or twice and walked back, OK? That a market cannot work that way. That is not efficient, OK? So what happens when the railroads come, as soon as they touch these hinterland areas, those areas are utterly transformed. Because the Appalachian Mountains were just a huge, insuperable, insuperable barrier between the east and the rest of the country. The railroads, the canals, they eliminate that barrier. And you're a farmer now. You can buy manufactured goods at a reasonable cost from the east. You can buy clothing from the east. How are you going to buy them? You need cash. How are you going to get cash? You have to grow goods for the market. And instantly, when this transformation happened, farmers, they might just, they're no longer subsistence farmers. In fact, they might not even grow their own food anymore because the food is not the most efficient crop. They want to grow for the market. So as soon as the railroads come, boom, everyone near them is a player in the market. And that's what Lincoln wanted. So he supported these um, transportation improvements, as they are called, for, towards the ultimate end of a market dynamism, where you create a diverse economy, where there are many different ways for people to rise up in the world. And you had to have, he believed, rightly in my view, some level of government support because these are enormous projects. You have no sophisticated financial system to speak of. You don't have angel investors of the sort you know, that back Facebook now. They didn't exist. You didn't have big industrialists. So you needed uh, some level of government support. Now, that, that was, that's in a nutshell. That's the Whig economic program. The other great Whig insight had to do with culture. And it was that people had to live orderly lives and practice self-discipline to make uh, the most of themselves. And Lincoln lived this ethic. He also preached this ethic. Aspiring lawyers later on in his life, when he'd become a lawyer, would write to him saying, how do I become a lawyer? And he'd write back things like, work, work, work is the thing. His stepbrother stayed back on the farm, living that kind of life where Lincoln, uh, that Lincoln had grown up in, and would fairly often ask Lincoln for loans. And just the letters that wrote, Lincoln wrote back were just excoriating. You say, you're not a bad person, but um, you're destitute because you idle away all your time. Go to work. That is the only cure for your case. Now, this might have made for awkward Thanksgiving dinners, but this is where Lincoln was, was coming from. And he, of course, himself exemplified this ethic. From his youth, he was a determined and stubborn reader. And this is part of the great Lincoln myth now that we, legend that we celebrate. But a lot of people frowned on it uh, at the time. You had neighbors saying, well, he's awfully lazy. He just sits, sits around reading all day. There's a, a, a quote from a neighbor saying, he wasn't any good to do real work like killing snakes, but he read anyway. And it was really a uh, very specific and conscious program of self-improvement that he embarked on. And at a time when the country was soaked in alcohol, soaked in tobacco, he didn't drink, smoke, swear, chew. He used to like to tell a story on himself of sharing a railway car with a gentleman from Kentucky who offered him a shot of whiskey. No thanks. Offered him a fine cigar. No thanks. Offered him a chew of tobacco. No thanks. And then the Kentuckian looks at Lincoln and says, can I tell you something, uh, sir? And Lincoln said, what is it? He said, I've learned one thing in life. Those with damn few vices have damn few virtues. <laughs> but Lincoln had damn few vices. And in fact, at a time 
when casual cruelty towards animals was common, Lincoln was in, um, incredibly and embarrassingly tenderhearted towards animals. When he rode the circuit with other lawyers, there was one incident where he was uh, at the back of the pack and all of a sudden disappeared. And they're waiting for him, wondering where he had gone. And the lawyer who had been riding back for him, they asked him what happened to Lincoln. He said, oh, he's, he's off looking for the baby birds that fell out of the nest. And when he finally caught up, they all, as you can imagine, had, you know, sort of tough, tough guys. Uh, said, you know, what are you doing? They made fun of him. And he said, if I did not return those birds to the mother, I wouldn't have been able to sleep tonight. Um, there was a cat in the White House, and there's a story uh, of how Lincoln at dinner one night, the cat was sitting in the chair next to him, and he started feeding this cat with the official White House flatware. Mary Todd, uh, understandably, was outraged and says to the witness uh, of this event, you know, don't you think it's crazy that the President of the United States is feeding the cat with official White House silverware. And Lincoln said, well, if this gold fork was good enough for Buchanan, it's good enough for Tabby. <laughs> so through this relentless ethic of self-improvement, what happens? He becomes a lawyer. Now, we tend to think of lawyers these days as parasitic bottom feeders. Present company accepted, I'm sure. But then, lawyers were really the shock troops of American capitalism. They were creating the rules of the road for this new emerging, emerging market economy. Now, Lincoln initially wasn't a very big time lawyer. He would carry letters around in his hat. There's one letter uh, that exists from him to a client saying, I'm sorry I took so long to get back to you, but I left your letter in my old hat just when I bought a new one. So it took me weeks to realize where it was. Uh, one clerk says that actually, because when Lincoln was a congressman, apparently he would carry around seeds to distribute to farmers. This is something I guess congressmen uh, did then, the equivalent of pork barrel projects, but much cheaper. And apparently he dropped some in the office, and the floor was so dirty that there was actually enough soil for a plant to uh, spring up in, in the floor. So, But eventually he um, became much more important as a lawyer. And he became a lawyer for corporations. In fact, he was on retainer for the biggest corporation in the state of Illinois, the Illinois Central Railroad. And um, Lincoln was Liberals have a, lot, a hard time getting their heads around this. He was a friend of banks. He was a friend of corporations. And his, his economics gave a pride of place to private property rights, to patent law. He gave a speech once saying that patent law was one of the top three discoveries of all of human history. Um, Lincoln and his Whigs, they didn't believe there was anything really as zero sum economics. A properly working uh, market economy benefited everyone. And they rejected class warfare and redistributionist economics. Lincoln famously said to a delegation of working men who came to visit him in the White House during the war, let not him who is houseless pull down the house of another, but let him labor diligently and build one of his own. The most important thing undergirding this entire view was a belief in the fundamental dignity of labor and the rights of people to the proceeds of their own labor. Again and again, Lincoln would come back to a line from Genesis, thou shalt eat through the sweat of thy brow. Or as he put it more informally, he who earns the corn should eat the corn. And anything that violated this principle was an act of theft. And this brings us to slavery because he talked about slavery in exactly these terms. The second inaugural address is that famous phrase, unrequited toil. Well, what was slavery? It was the theft of people's labor. And just to give you an idea how strongly Lincoln felt about this, when he was a young man, his father hired him out, as was his father's right. So Lincoln would go and hoe and uh, take care of hogs and split rails and chop down trees. And his father would take the proceeds, as was his right, until Lincoln was age 21. And Lincoln said, now this is self-pitying. It's an exaggeration. But again, it gives you an idea of where he came, was coming from on this. He said, I used to be a slave. I used to be a slave. Because he worked, and someone else took the proceeds. And um, of course, you had a much more serious and literal slavery in the South, a system, as Lincoln said, that was based on classification and caste and on a human bondage 
that required stealing the, the theft, uh, stealing the labor of others. And uh, Lincoln hammered away at the system throughout the 1850s, and he argued, you know, slavery is the only good that people want for others, but not themselves. And he wrote, when he was thinking things through, he'd write these fragments to him, himself. And there's one on the ant. And he says, this is such a simple and universal and natural principle. Even the ant, this crawling insect, if an ant gets a crumb and works to take it back to the nest, and you try to take that crumb from the ant, the ant knows it, that crumb, crumb belongs to it because it has worked for it and it will fight you to uh, hold on to that crumb. Now, advocates of slavery, they fought back. They said, okay, sure, we have slaves, but you have wage slaves in the North. You know, have this whole class of people who may not make very much money and may not have very much uh, opportunity to get ahead. At least we care for our slaves, but you have this callous system of every man for himself, um, and you pretend to care by paying them uh, a pittance. And Lincoln just rejected this with every fiber of his being. He said they didn't, don't understand the way a free economy works and the way a free economy should work. He said the man who labored for another last year, this year labors for himself, and next year will hire others to labor for him. On another occasion, he said advancement, improvement of condition is the order of things in a society of equals. Whereas slavery, on the other hand, he said, had a tendency to dehumanize, excuse my antiquated language, to dehumanize the Negro, to take away from him the right of ever striving to be a man. And that is such a Lincolnian sentiment. We strive to be men and women, and it's in the pursuit of bettering ourselves that we are uh, fully human. And throughout this period, Lincoln's rhetoric is suffused with a profound sense of loss because he believed our founders had been embarrassed by slavery. They tolerated it because it existed and there was no easy way to get away, uh, to do away with it right away. The Constitution tolerates slavery, but it doesn't mention it. It's clearly embarrassed by it. But you had in the South um, a defense of slavery that rose up that was affirmative in nature, that was positive in nature that said this is a good thing. It's good for society. It's good for the slaves. So Lincoln looked back to the past with yearning. And in, in American culture at almost all times, we celebrate the new. And Lincoln was just unabashed about referring to the founders as those old time men. He called us back to the old Declaration of Independence. He advocated for the old faith. And his program, I believe, as any conservative program in America worthy of the name should be was about rene renewal, about progress and creating more opportunity, but doing it through a return, through a restoration of our principles. And one gorgeous passage in the speech, he said, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it. Let us turn and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the revolution. And he believed that these free institutions bequeathed to us not only guaranteed our rights, but they guaranteed our prosperity. There's a, a little speech he gave during the war to a, a, um, a regiment from Ohio, 166 regiment, came to see him in the White House. And he said, anytime troops come to see me, I want to tell them a little bit about why I think this struggle, why this war is so important, and um, why it's um, why we're fighting it. And he said, you see, you know, I'm, I'm in this big White House. Um, you too, your son, can be in this big White House. And he said, it is an order that each of you may th have through this free government which we have enjoyed, an open field and a fair chance for your industry, enterprise, and intelligence, that you may have equal privileges in the race of life with all its desirable aspirations it is for this the struggle should be maintained, that we may not lose our birthright, not only for one, but for two or three years. The nation is worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable jewel. And obviously the struggle was won, and I believe he bequeathed to us modern America. 
And so here you have this great American. He ha believes in a dynamic economy. He has this deep-seated belief in the importance of individual striving and individual initiative. He rejects class warfare. He has this iron-clad fidelity to our free institutions and our founders. And we're supposed to believe that Barack Obama is a natural heir, heir to, to him, which I just um, totally uh, reject. And I think it's so important for us to focus on Lincoln uh, at this time, because I believe there's a crisis of opportunity in America. We've seen a, a lot of focus the last several years over inequality, which is, has genuinely grown over the last several decades. I think some level of inequality obviously is inevitable in a free society. What we should focus on is mobility. Do people like Lincoln, like Nixon, do they have a chance to rise up from nothing uh, in this country? And we, the fact is, we are not as mobile as we think. There are actually Western European countries that are more mobile than we are. Other English-speaking countries, Scandinavian countries, that are mo mo more mobile than we are. And this um, has uh, obviously a large part to do with uh, broad economic trends, but it also has to do with culture and a social breakdown we are seeing in this country, where you've seen the breakdown of family, you're seeing the breakdown of the work ethic, and you're seeing the breakdown of individual um, responsibility. So I think it behooves um, conservatives to consider what is the program that will increase mobility in this society. And I believe it goes back to what is a kind of the trinity that Lincoln supported, a, a, um, a dynamic economy, education, and a return to those very basic bourgeois virtues. And this isn't Bible thumping stuff. It doesn't have to be moralistic, but the things that make it easier to get ahead, marriage, work, discipline. Um, so I'll just leave you with one, one last uh, passage uh, from Lincoln. He, uh, long before anyone had heard of him, he gave what was called the Lyceum speech as a young man in Springfield. And he talked about how even then, this weak, immature country, that we are invulnerable to military assault. He said, you can take all the armies of the world, you can put the greatest general anyone's ever known, Napoleon, at the head of these armies, and they couldn't take a step on the Blue Ridge Mountains. They couldn't dip a foot in the Ohio River by force of arms. But then he went on to say, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that we should resolve to live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lowry, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he has agreed to take some questions. As Sandy mentioned, this is being broadcast live to the world. And so, we have so taken- So keep it clean, people. We have also um, taken questions from the internet. And our first one is gonna come from Jennifer Blake from Alexandria, Virginia. Which leaders today are most like Lincoln? Which leaders of today are most like Lincoln? Um, I really don't think we have any that I'm aware of. I'm open to, uh, I'm open to suggestions. I've uh, spoken why I think Barack Obama isn't that leader. I would say Mitt Romney uh, wasn't that leader. Um, you know, it helps a lot in America if you've lived this story. Um, and I think Mitt Romney, through no fault of his own, obviously, uh, hadn't lived this story. And I, so I think there was always a self-consciousness there, a certain defensiveness about his wealth that was um, in contrast to his dad. There's a wonderful exchange um, uh, with his father on a sidewalk during one of his campaigns where someone said, oh, you're a rich guy, you're a tool of the rich. And he's like, no, you know, I came from nothing. I earned every dime of this. And uh, Mitt was never able to quite say that. I, I think um, it behooves the Republican Party. Everything it says, everything it does, should be through this Lincolnian prism of opportunity and aspiration. And it's heartening to me 
uh, I wouldn't deem any of them uh, Lincoln-like uh, necessarily, but it's heartening to, heartening to me that you have Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, Bobby Jindal, leaders of that nature, talking in these terms. Because otherwise, I think the Republican Party is, um, uh, has no future in this country. Because you know the Whigs and the Republicans of that time had the same problem. People associated them with the elite. People said they were pro-rich. And the, the great achievement of Lincoln was to demonstrate how his economics um, helped, were, were designed to help everyone and to help the, the little guy climbing up. And that's what the contemporary Republican Party needs to do as well. Here's our next question. Thank you for your presentation. I'm one of those awful lawyers. Actually, <laughs> I, I like to think of myself as a good lawyer, and I went to UVA I'm sure law you school, and I know you went to a UVA. A good law school. It is. Uh, you mentioned early on in your presentation that uh, Lincoln and the Whigs had supported the idea of government subsidies yeah. as a way to sort of build things up. And so I'd like to sort of walk down that slippery slope just a little bit here. Milton Friedman's position was that the government should have very little role in what goes on in the country other than defense, uh, criminal justice system, a police force, and those things that aren't in the interests of private entities to produce. Well, we've seen subsidies uh, go to places like Solyndra, yeah. and there are all kinds of government subsidies now. Maybe back in Lincoln's day, the subsidies were relatively small and not uh, intrusive, but given that government naturally grows, mm -hmm. if you're supporting um, subsidies in Lincoln's day, wouldn't it naturally follow that you'd be supporting yeah. subsidies today? And if you aren't, or you're supporting some of them, where do you draw the line? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say um, a couple things. One, so much of what, every time government spends anything now, it's called an investment, right? I mean, it's kind of a joke. But th these projects, some of them were, back then, were genuinely investments. If you read about the Erie Canal, it paid for itself almost immediately. Um, and it transformed the whole economy in that area, and it transformed it in a way that would be much more, we'd be much more favorable towards. It actually created a market where there wasn't one before. So I think if you get a slippery slope from doing the Erie Canal to doing what we have now, that's a heck of a slope. And there's a lot of distance between those two things. And I support, I think most people support, I don't oppose government roads, I don't oppose government bridges, as long as they make e economic sense, funded in a rational way, and they're not an excuse, one, for politicized spending, or two, a misbegotten um, attempt to create short-term stimulus. I mean, it should just be funding stuff that, that, uh, that actually makes sense. And if that's all government did, zero. I and mean, what, what percentage of the federal government would, um, of GDP would the federal government be spending? I don't know, it's probably like 1% or something. We'd have almost nothing that we have now. And so Lincoln had a more positive view of government than we'll ever have uh, as conservatives, but it was a different kind of government. What the federal government does now, even though all Democrats talk about is investment and infrastructure, mainly what it does and what it's best at is taking money from some people and giving it to others. That is a fact. That's the entitlement state. That's the welfare state. There was none of that, obviously, in the mid-19th century. There was no bureaucracy to speak of. The State Department, I believe, in 1863, you know, in the middle of a war, had 33 employees. There was no regulation. And um, I'm a little hesitant to predict where Lincoln would be on various things 150 years later. But I have a hard time believing he just wouldn't find it absolutely anathema, all we do to obstruct the development of our own country, right? I mean, you have states like New York that are um, dragging their feet and doing everything they can to obstruct this great natural gas revolution we have going on that creates good blue-collar jobs, that gets wealth out of the ground and in, into the um, economy, that, has, um, that lowers the price of electricity and makes manufacturing um, better. Everyone should be doing somersaults of joy over this, but we're blocking it. Same thing with the Keystone Pipeline, right? There's an infrastructure project, and what is government doing? It's studying it and blocking it and layers of environmental review. No offense, again, I don't, I don't have that much of a bugaboo about lawyers, but all these lawsuits, right, filed by environmental, gr environmental groups to stop it from happening. So I would just argue the fundamental break 
and the nature of American government came with a new deal. It was the progressives, and it wasn't that Abraham Lincoln wanted to fund a canal. Now, by the way, so, some of what he did um, was excessive and uh, ridiculous. I mean, he supported a program in Illinois that got way out of hand because everyone looked at the Erie Canal and said, well, that paid for itself, so everything can pay for itself. And they, uh, they passed a program in Illinois that, that basically bankrupted the state. The Transcontinental Railroad, everyone cites and looks on favorably um, for understandable reasons, very heroic venture, kind of the moonshot of the age, but it enabled the worst kind of fraud and corruption you can imagine. So I would be favorably inclined to that kind of transportation program back then, but even back then, you had to have a, you know, a, a, a very skeptical eye uh, about a lot of it. But we didn't get, the Erie Canal did not create Medicare Part D. Right? I mean, they're just they're, they're separate th things. And I don't think the slope is that steep or quite that slippery. And if you're upset about it, you should blame FDR, not, not Abraham Lincoln. Next question to your right. Thank you for coming to Yorba Linda, land of gracious living. Could you tell us something about what you're doing? What is the National Review doing? And what are you doing? And where is it going? And what is its direction? Well, sir, I'm trying to flog a book. I don't know, maybe I haven't made this clear. I, I guess I, I haven't made this clear. Amazon.com, <laughs> Lincoln Unbound. No, well, um, a National Review, we are doing what we've been doing since 1955 when our founder, and the great um, William F. Buckley, wrote the initial editorial saying our role was to stand athwart history with a capital H and yell stop. And uh, National Review has always thrived in adversity, and the good news is we have more adversity than ever. Um, I mean, this country is really in trouble, and it's, it's not just the, the top line stuff, um, the size of government, uh, the debt. I, I really believe so many of our systems make no sense anymore and were really handed down to us from the mid 20th century, reflect industrial age assumptions that no longer apply. This is certainly true to our entitlement programs, of our entitlement programs, Medicare, Social Security. It's true, I believe, of our educational system, you know, not just K through 12, but college, where we're spending more and getting less because, I mean, there's some studies that show like the cognitive development of kids in college like regresses <laughs> rather than it advances, and this social breakdown. And it's dismaying to me that it's really the top third of the country in educational terms, people with a college degree and more, who have learned that the basic bourgeois virtues work and they help you get ahead. You look at the um, illegitimacy rate among that top third, it's 6%. It's just 6%. You know, that's, I don't know. What level? That's 1930s level or something. I don't know, maybe that's even 19th century levels. That's a really low number. And you look at the middle, um, middle swath of the country, people with a uh, high school degree, some college, but not a college degree, right in the middle. And on all these sorts of measures, they're beginning to look more like the bottom than they are at the top. In 1982, when Reagan was president, the illeg illegitimacy rate among those folks was 14%. Now it's 44%. And it makes, it's, it's harder for the, mothers and fathers of those children. It's harder for the children. So what I worry about is you have the top third that has all sorts of economic advantages because they, they're just doing just fine in a globalized economy, but also have these social advantages that are in effect passed down to their children. And you don't see that happening in the rest of the country. And that's how you get a class society that we may be America still in name, we may be still pretty rich, we may still be pretty powerful, but that's not what this country was, and it's not what it should be. Let's take another one from the web. This one's from Jesse Angelo from Chicago, Illinois. How would Lincoln address the divisions in today's political climate? How would Lincoln have addressed the divisions in today's political climate? Well, this is one objection I have to the, the movie Lincoln. Is, did, did everyone see Lincoln? Some people see Lincoln. It's a, it's a wonderful depiction of Lincoln. And going down to very small details, one scene I loved in the movie that just captured him to a T, um, and you may think I'm strange by focusing on this, but there's one scene, you might not even remember it, where he's sitting at his desk in the White House, and he has a ruler, and there's a, a watch, I think, hanging off his desk, and he's just knocking it back and forth, back and forth. And that's such a Lincoln thing, because he had a really brooding 
nature. Again, we tend to think of him as this common guy, this jokester, but he was impossible to get to know. He basically had no close friends. And even the people who spent the most time with him said there was just this, this barrier you couldn't get past. So he's a brooding guy, and he was also fascinated with mechanics and how things worked. He'd stop and examine every new agricultural implement he would see out on the circuit. And he had this logical cast of mind. I mean, he studied Euclid in his spare time. When he got to Congress, he checked out Euclid from the Library of Congress. How many congressmen today could go and check out a copy of Euclid? And he referred to the and this came through in his advocacy and his argumentation. He referred to the Declaration as the definition and the definitions and axioms of a free um, society. So my problem with the movie is the way it was interpreted. What, what was happening in the movie? Lincoln, as a matter of principle, wanted to get the 13th Amendment because it was right as a matter of principle. And he was impatient about it and wanted it right then. Okay? And now he, he was a consummate politician in getting it and the wheeling and dealing and getting it, but it wasn't a compromise, right? It was someone getting what they wanted as a matter of principle. So I think too often when we think about Washington today, we just think you should split every difference and compromise every issue. And perhaps there's something to be said for that, but that's not where Lincoln would be. I mean, he was, as a young man, he was an incredibly slashing partisan. He would make people cry. There's something called the skinning of Thomas, where this, um, there's a debate between Lincoln and this, this guy, I believe, named Jesse Thomas. And Lincoln uh, uh, mocked him. He imitated him, uh, ridiculed him. And this, this poor guy left the stage in tears. And Lincoln eventually apologized. He'd write uh, anonymous newspaper articles just scathing, again, ridiculing people. And he did it to the state auditor of Illinois, who found out that it was Lincoln who did this, and challenged him to a duel. And Lincoln was not a natural duelist, had no interest in dueling, but you pretty much had to accept if you're going to save your honor. And as the challenged party, he got to pick the weapons, so he said, we're going to do it with cavalry broadswords. And uh, that might seem like a ridiculous choice of weapon until you realize Lincoln had about a, a foot-long reach on this guy. And someone afterwards said, why did you choose that weapon? You're making fun of the whole thing. He's like, no, I, I, I was worried that if we pick pistols, he'd shoot and kill me. And it, it turned out that the dispute was adjudicated and the duel didn't happen. But Lincoln was a man of, um, now that, that sort of partisanship was from, for his younger days, but he was a man of principle. And his statesmanship consisted, I think, as all great statesmanship does, of having an ultimate fixed goal and then being flexible in how you get there and being persuasive. He, he had a line in one of his addresses that a drop of honey always attracts more flies than a gallon of gall. And I think some on the Republican side especially, some of our friends don't understand that. But a little sweetness and persuasion can go a long way. So he was flexible, he was persuasive, but the ultimate goals never changed. And he didn't just compromise away uh, those goals. He was compromising in how he achieved them, and he ultimately did. Next question right here in front. Hi, Rich. Um, curious, did you do any research about his and Mary's relationship? Because we've hear, we heard, you know, they weren't each other's first pick to marry. They kind of tolerated each other, or they really loved each other. Yeah. What kind of so Mar did you get? Mary Todd and uh, Lincoln's relationship. There is so much literature on this. I just I couldn't get into it except for the very surface. And there's a story about Lincoln that when he was going to their wedding, which was kind of a snap uh, wedding, that some kid asked him, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going to hell. You know, which doesn't, it's not like the greatest uh, start to a marriage. And I, I think Mary Todd, I mean, she was a little bit crazy. And the, um, the horrible blows to her you know, made her really crazy. But um, I'm not with those, though, that have this sort of contempt for her and take, um, you know, blame her for everything, every difficulty in the relationship. Because Lincoln, as I was just discussing, was not an easy guy himself. And as she said afterwards in an interview, when, when uh, Lincoln felt the most, he expressed the least. And I'm a little bit like that, not to the extreme. It drives my wife crazy. And I'm sure it drove Mary Todd crazy. And the way she was um, very good for him, though, she was just as ambitious, just as ambitious uh, as he was in his first campaign for the Senate, which doesn't get noticed as much. It wasn't really a campaign because the state legislature um, picked the senators then. But she was there 
you know, when the legislature was voting, and she was keeping track of every single vote. And if you're an ambitious political guy, there's no substitute for a wife who is right there with you. And then also, she was a, a huge step up for him. You know, she went to a fancy French academy. She took his, she had a pony that she took to show Henry Clay, you know, the foremost statesman uh, of the age. So in that sense, she was quite the cash for him. So it obviously wasn't a, a perfect um, relationship, and there's some about, so much about it we'll never know, um, but I'm a little softer on, on Mary Todd than, than others are. Next this question. is a pander for the women in the audience, too. <laughs> Next question right here. I'm, I'm curious, as a current affairs writer and commentator, what drove you back in history to write about Lincoln? Yeah, um, I've always just, I love him, uh, I, uh, and I love the story. And there's nothing that um, uh, people making the most of themselves and their talents is very important to me. I have a disabled brother, so I feel very strongly that any talent you have is a complete gift, and it is you know, a, sh a shame and a sin not to make the most of it. So I just love how Lincoln made the most of himself. It would have been very easy just, you know, this subsistence, um, this life in subsistence agriculture wasn't necessarily that bad. You know, his dad, who he had a very complicated, uh, I shouldn't say complicated, just had a bad relationship uh, with. He was perfectly content. He wasn't a bad man. Spends lots of time hunting and fishing. You don't, um, you know, some, some, Eyewitnesses, neighbors said of his dad, you know, he didn't think God was gold. Um, he uh, didn't chase after things. So, so there's something to be said for that way of life, but it just doesn't make the most of you. And Lincoln's drive to make the most of himself, that, that really, um, I was really drawn to that. And, and I really think that that just undergirds everything. You know, the two-part program, one, and, and that kind of isolation. So people you know, in the hinterlands, have their chances to rise and end slavery because it, it blights, obviously, the opportunity of entire class of people by definition and also blights the opportunities of poor whites who can't compete with plantations because they don't have the, the gang labor they can force, you know, by brute force to go out into their field. So Lincoln's aspiration to making the most of himself and then um, how he made it possible for others to make the most of themselves and the fact that I think this is an area where we really, as a country, need to new, do better. All, all that sent me back to Lincoln. Next question right here. You mentioned that President Lincoln read Euclid when he was in the White House and that he was an avid reader throughout his life. What are some of the other books that he liked or which influenced him? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. He, um, he, he was soaked in the Bible and he, as time went on, he became a more religious man under the pressure of events, under the pressure of personal tragedy. He was never, there's a huge debate about this as well, there's a debate about everything. Uh, I don't believe he was an Orthodox Christian ever, but he was um, deeply religious. And the second inaugural address is, I think, the most profoundly religious state paper in American history and will never be uh, surpassed. Because he, he spent a lot of time grappling with God and grappling with God's will. And then Shakespeare, loved Shakespeare, knew Shakespeare, could recite Shakespeare by heart. And you just consider those two things. If, if you read nothing else, if you're reading the Bible and the Shakespeare, that's pretty good training as a writer. And he was our best presidential writer, with the exception, perhaps, of Thomas Jefferson. And on top of these things, he was an amateur poet, which also tends to make you a better writer. So the music of words mattered deeply to him. And then when you take that music and you wed it to the profound purposes he had and the attachment to our founding and its principles, that, that's where you get these speeches um, from the ages. And if you also, if you go back and read, look at what was in these readers, I, I kind of um, had a uh, very uh, skeptical depiction of education at the time, but they did have these readers for kids that just had everything in them, excerpts of all sorts of literature, excerpts of great speeches throughout American history. And in one of the tragedies of American life, we don't have anything like that anymore, really, for kids. We have um, you know, watered down, politically correct uh, textbooks that have language that's uh, forgettable 
at best. So he, he was really able to soak himself in the best words that had been uttered and written in American history and through Shakespeare and the Bible throughout human history. We have time for one more question. We'll take it from the web. This one is from James Snow, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Is today's GOP anything at all like Lincoln's GOP? Is today's GOP anything at all like um, Lincoln's GOP? Well, there's a difference. We've talked about some, the, the, um, the view of government. But I think the economics are very similar besides that. I think the, um, obviously, the, uh, the idea that a rising tide lifts all boats is a commonality. And the devotion to the founding. Uh, is a commonality. And it's just astonishing mean, to me that politicians like Ted Cruz, who are you know, constitutionalists to the core, they're treated with contempt or some sort of weirdos because they care so much about the Constitution and the founding. And that's something where Lincoln was right there. You know, he, another line he quoted from the Bible was that the, uh, the Declaration is like the, uh, the golden apple and the Constitution is the silver frame. So the Declaration represents the purpose of our government, what we want to achieve through our government, the equality of all men. And the means of doing it is the Constitution. And he basically was confronted by two rival camps, both of which wanted to uh, dispense with the Constitution in important respects, one of which he was uh, allied with. The abolitionists thought the Constitution was a pact with the devil. And they would burn it, and tear it up, and uh, condemn it. And then you had the um, secessionists who wanted to leave. So the abolitionists um, were upset with the Constitution because they thought it afforded too much protection to slavery. And then you had the secessionists who wanted to leave and write another Constitution because they didn't think that the Constitution afforded enough protection to slavery. Lincoln was in the middle, and he hewed um, to the Constitution. And that ultimately is the most important thing, and that's a commonality with today's Republican Party. Mr. Lori, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. He will be uh, available in the front lobby to sign his book. If you haven't picked it up yet, be sure to grab one. They're available in our museum store. Um, and yes, he came tonight to see all of you. Yes, he came to see the beautiful East Room and to talk his book. But the reason he's actually here is he knows about the lavish gifts that the Nixon Foundation gives to its various authors and personalities. And we have a one-of-a-kind, what would Nixon do coffee mug which, which coincidentally are also available if you sign up for a membership tonight and in our museum store. Please pick one up. Mr. Lowry, thank you.